orchestration and the re-recording of book one has been a huge project. Hearing these, these old themes like actually being played by an orchestra has been wild. In my imagination, that was how it was supposed to sound. I'm Jeremy Zuckerman. I'm the composer for Avatar, The Last Airbender, and The Legend of Korra. I'm putting an orchestra together. Orchestra, huh? Well, la-dee-da. There wasn't a plan B or, you know, what if? It's just, I'm gonna do music for a living. I didn't know I'd be doing composition. I thought I was gonna be a guitarist in a rock band or something. And I'm actually really happy that it just didn't turn out that way. So I graduated from CalArts and right away started doing commercials. And I snuck in as a sound designer. And they realized that I, you know, I had my master's in music composition, so why not let me do music as well? And so then I started doing that and I got a lot of experience I'm writing music like in lots of different genres and different emotions and I, it really expanded my palette. And when I had the opportunity to pivot to Avatar, you know, I left commercials and didn't look back. So I met Ben Wynn, who did the sound design for Avatar at CalArts. And then through Ben, I met Brian Konitsko, co-creator of Avatar, of course, one of the daddies of Avatar. Hi, this is Brian Konitsko. I remember at some point, Brian reaching out to both Ben and me and saying he wanted us to do the music and sound design. And he also wanted someone who wasn't like a seasoned film or TV composer to do it. He wanted a different approach. Nickelodeon wanted us to sort of prove ourselves, which is understandable because we didn't really have much of a track record. And so we did an animatic and then we did the pilot. For the pilot, we both did music and we both did sound design together. And then we had to separate duties after that. This is the proto Agnikai, but it's it sounds like the chipmunk version. <laughs> I remember staying up all night finishing this pilot and then coming home completely delirious. It was like 10 a.m. by the time we finished. We'd gone all night. It seemed so hard. We were just figuring it all out as we went. We would work at Brian and Ben's house in sort of this weird little nook that had like two computers and like a keyboard and some random instruments, but we were working on a melody. It was like the French horn main theme. And Brian said, that's it, from the other room. We were like, oh, okay, all right. He just shouted from the other room that that was it. You know, he, he heard it and he knew that that was, that was the main theme. Yeah, this ought to get everybody moving. The Avatar instrumental palette took a while to sort of take shape, and it started with a bit more of a sort of quirky DIY kind of approach, where I started realizing that Avatar wanted more, it wanted a bit more epic sort of orchestral sound in addition to those unique timbres of, you know, these sort of non-Western instruments. So I started sifting through these libraries, and these libraries were really primitive at the time, these MIDI libraries. So MIDI sends information, tells the computer what note, you know, how long, how loud. And MIDI is uh, really powerful in that you can make orchestral music with MIDI for very cheap, but it also is sort of problematic in that it doesn't sound like a real orchestra. That is correct, Master Arrowhead. I had my palette, which was orchestral instruments like woodwinds, brass, strings, percussion. And then I also had my weird collection of instruments that I would record myself playing and then sort of edit and make it sound halfway decent and plug it in. A lot of the performances were pretty spontaneous and we're, we're pretty much take one. So there's definitely like warts and things in some of those performances, but I think that it sort of like lended itself to the aesthetic of the show and sort of the innocence, you know, of the characters. I think that the Blue Spirit stuff, that for me was, was sort of a, a big moment. I was discovering the Duduk at the same time and I really loved playing it. It was just like, it's just such a wild sounding instrument. It's so expressive, it's the slightest little sort of articulations in your mouth can make a huge differences sonically. And so it was really fun to play that and to start to develop that theme. So the blue spirit, I wonder who could be behind that mask. <sighs> One of the things I really loved about Avatar was that it wasn't afraid to get really heavy, really serious, really emotional, sad, dark, but it always served a purpose and it always served the story and the characters. And I never worried about going too dark. There might have been a comment like early, like maybe in the first episode from someone that it was a little sad or something. 
And I think we all just ignored it. I think Brian might have mentioned it, said, don't worry about it. He's like, I heard this, but it's fine. Proceed. And in fact, it got much sadder and darker and heavier. And we never dumbed down the emotions. And we, we would talk about that. Kids are emotional beings, just like adults. They just don't have the language sometimes. I just always did what I felt was right for the scene. Sometimes that was super goofy, trombone poopy pants cues. <sighs> do they have bathrooms in the spirit world? As a matter of fact, they do not. And sometimes it was really like dark, almost sonic art stuff, like the Co music, which if you listen back, it's pretty abstract stuff and it's pretty creepy. And that was like creating clusters with a cello and doing microtonal stuff. Microtonal means if you look at our piano, you see that we have, you know, the same pattern of 12 notes over and over, but there's all kinds of frequencies in between each key. So there's all kinds of like microtonal stuff in Co and weird timbral sliding and scraping on the bow and different extended techniques and stuff. And I was also at that time, I was studying scores of 20th century composers like Penderecki and Zanakis and um, Takemitsu and composers like that. And I was totally inspired by those guys and wanted to figure out how to bring some of that vocabulary into this a little bit. I must be going now. We'll meet again. This is called the Gujian. It's a Chinese zither. So I was really motivated to get decent on it because I wanted to be able to play on it. Just knowing that people were going to be hearing me and if I sounded terrible, uh, you know, I had no one to blame but myself. <laughs> so this is Winter, Spring, Summer, and Fall, sung by Iro. Mako was the actual voice actor, and it was a really beautiful performance he did. Dealing with the, the four cultures was so interesting because this wasn't necessarily Earth. And so these cultures weren't any real specific culture that existed, you know, in reality. I think that was really good because it could get really problematic if you have like evil guys be a certain culture. And that was something we were very conscious about. From this moment on, I will be known as the Phoenix King. Making a duduk be a bad guy's instrument, for instance. The duduk was Zuko's instrument, but it was Zuko when he was evolving and having an emotional journey. It had nothing to do with him in his sort of negative state. And so those kinds of instruments that I used when I was dealing with that were a lot more sort of generic and vague, like brass. And that was more speaking to the tropes of film and TV music, where you have big, heavy Mahler-esque brass, and that represents like bad guys. And it, and it makes sense because it's weighty. So it worked for the Fire Nation, but we also tweaked it a little bit. Ben had this uh, piece of equipment. It was even tied like high-end sort of reverb box and had this incredibly like dramatic 60 second reverb. So we would run the brass through that. I just ran like one long note through it and then I sort of played it. So sometimes that would double with the brass and it gave it this sort of otherworldly sound. It gave it something a little extra, a little sort of psychological. For the end credits, that was based on Indonesian monkey chant. And you get that kind of thing. And then you like overlay it and offset it. You get these like crazy phasing things and very much inspired by that. So this is a pipa, Chinese lute. Um, I used it on winter, spring, summer, and fall. All the Chong band stuff, songs from uh, Cave of Two Lovers. Happy to go wherever the wind takes us. Kyoshi. A lot of times it's just that open. It's Kyoshi Warrior stuff. I don't think I ever hired anyone until the last four episodes, which was aired as one two hour event. And that's when we hired a um, sort of medium-sized string ensemble. I think it was 16 players. I wasn't working with Hong Wang yet, who, as I mentioned, is the Chinese multi-instrumentalist. He's fantastic. And I think I worked with him for about a year before I started Cora. 
which was great because I learned a lot in that amount of time and I continued to learn from him. So he slowly started to introduce me to more things and then I start to write for him. And then he would sort of be like, well, you know, that's a little high for this instrument. It's better in this range. And so over the course of the four years I worked with him, I really started to hone in on how to write for these things, these beautiful instruments and how to sort of write more idiomatically for them and give him space too. Like I would write very sort of simple parts that maybe had little, it's called grace notes or that are sort of embellishments. Yeah, all the sort of um, lead instruments are often hung and sometimes we would have Arhu play in unison with the strings or the violins. And I think that gave it a really unique sound. Naga, go! That a girl! Go, go, go! I think Avatar and Core are probably the hardest things I've ever worked on. Everyone was sort of at their A game. You can't ever phone anything in. Even the smallest little transitions, equal amount of care went into those moments as this huge, epic, important season finale moments, you know? The reorchestration and the re-recording of book one has been a huge project. It's been over a year that we've been working on it. And I have to thank my assistant on this project, Brian Harold, who's been a huge help. He was an Avatar fan, so he was pretty motivated. Well, actually what we did first was we separately watched the whole series again and took notes on like our favorite musical moments and also moments that felt really important narratively and felt important to the fans. And we went through that and then we sort of picked out our favorite stuff and we made a crazy doc and figured out the durations and then we had to cut a bunch of stuff out. And then once we honed in on what we wanted, Brian rebuilt all the old sessions. Some of them were 18 years old, most of them actually. And then once we sort of had all our music and the track list, Brian made charts for the musicians. So he made the scores. And then we recorded strings in Budapest. And then we recorded brass in LA. And we hired a soloist, Josh Plotner, to do all the woodwinds. And then I went ahead and I fixed up some percussion because a lot of the percussion was really sort of dated sounding. And at the time, you get this thing called the machine gun effect where it's the same sample over and over again. And now libraries have gotten more sophisticated and they, they sort of randomize or go through in a sequence like different sort of samples of the same instrument. And I kept a lot of the other sounds and the old performances, I kept those. I didn't want to lose some of the magic of the original, but the elements that I felt didn't have much character, just sounded sort of cheap <laughs> or old. I replaced, but the big thing was recording musicians. That was huge. Ladies and gentlemen, the Flamio! Hearing these, these old themes like actually being played by an orchestra has been wild because in my imagination, that was how it was supposed to sound. That's what I was trying to evoke. So the, the, the session with Budapest to record the strings started at five in the morning because it's remote. So five in the morning, they start right with the premiere main title theme. And that was wild hearing that with a full string section. That was so cool. It was just like, oh, here we are. And it was, it's just thinking that it's about 18 years later. It's just so strange, but so wonderful. These remote recording sessions, they've really got it dialed in. And so you talk to the contractor over Zoom and then you use this other software to listen in real time. And so you give notes between takes and there's a conductor too. We made it work and it's really special. I think it sounds really special. I think it really worked. I think it's gonna be pretty exciting for people. I hope. Where have you been, Prince Zuko? You missed music night. The Ang Becomes Ocean track sounds pretty incredible with real players. Some of the epic stuff, you know, there's another one, the Northern Water Tribe. That's the one where they show up for the first time in the Northern Water Tribe and, and Sokka sees UA and all, that whole thing. That sounds really great. Some of the more intimate stuff though too, all of it's pretty transformed. It was one of those things where like, it's like when you paint a house and you paint the shutters and then you're like, oh, I'm paint everything. So we, we start out, we we're like, all right, we'll just do like a few cues, you know? And then we did like every, everything on the album.
started Avatar, I, I was sort of trying to get it right, you know? And I had no idea that it would have the legs it's had and the impact it's had. This kid who, he wanted to come out to his parents and he was really scared. And he listened to like something from Korra, The Greatest Change. He said it fired him up, like it helped him have the courage to come out to his parents. When we hit our lowest point, we are open to the greatest change. And then he talked to him and it was great. And it went great. And it was such a happy ending. And like stuff like that, or people who've talked about like the show, like helping them, like they're depressed and it's really helped them, you know, get through really dark periods. And that just like sort of blew me away. But backing up a little bit, it was probably the first year Avatar was out and Brian and Mike went to Comic-Con. And they came back and they told me people were asking about the music and it just felt like it was serving a purpose and it was functional and it was meant to just support. It never occurred to me that people would actually be interested in hearing the music on its own. So that was like, wow, people are listening. That's crazy. So that was pretty amazing. And now here we are all these years later and like we see people with like Appa hats, just seeing Avatar and Korra showing up in culture at unexpected times and random ways. And it's, it's really satisfying. Let's do it. Let's go on a vacation, just the two of us. Anywhere you want. Really? Okay. I've always wanted to see what the spirit world's like. Sounds perfect. So the Korra Asami moment, that I did not know anything about until right before I started working on that episode. We were doing what's called a spotting session, which we do for every episode, where we would go through a scene by scene, moment by moment, and talk about what needs to happen. So that blew me away. I was so excited. I was like freaking out. Oh man, I was just going nuts. I like couldn't sleep for like a couple of days. It just felt so important and meaningful and bold. I was excited that they were like doing that. Because this was what, 2014 or something, which things have opened up a lot. You know, they still have a ways to go, but they've opened up a lot in that amount of time. It feels really good because it's such a positive story. I feel like it's a, a good thing to have in the world. It's really nice being a part of this, this thing that's really seemed to have a real impact on people. It's just strange, I didn't expect it. I got lucky, you know, I was there at the right time and around the right people. And the ethos has always been, you know, making art with your friends. And I guess that energy out in the world has some purpose. Thank you.